Technology seems to have no limits these days. We put Land Rovers on Mars, alter genders, deliver packages using drones, and create chess-playing robots. Is there anything humans can't do? But I suppose the real question is, are there things humans shouldn't do? And that brings us into the conversation of designer babies. When I first told a couple of my friends that I was giving a TED Talk on designer babies, they looked at me with blank faces and confused stares. One of them even asked, you mean like a toddler in Michael Kors and a fur coat? <laughs> but no, not designer babies as in the kids of Kanye West and Kim Kardashian or Beyonce and Jay-Z, but kids whose genetic makeup are actually designed. Now, as many of you may be thinking, how the heck can you design a child? It's not like you can mix sugar, spice, and everything nice to make the next Powerpuff Girls. Or maybe you can. Recently, scientists have used gene editing tools to modify the building blocks of organic existence, DNA and genes. The DNA in our cells act as a recipe to make each beautiful individual. They provide certain instructions and ingredients to make each part of the meal, and these instructions are called bases. These bases are strung together in precise sequences which tell the cells in our body how to behave and form the basis for our every trait. Much like how a recipe gives a certain instructions on how to produce an outstanding meal. Using gene editing tools, scientists have been able to change the DNA involved in the expression of the fundamental features of an organism. Much like how a chef can take the recipe for a chocolate cake, substitute butter with olive oil, thus changing its consistency, an important, act, or important part of the cake. Through genetic engineering, scientists have been able to make huge strides in both science and society by generating drought-resistant plants, curing genetic diseases, and possibly stunting the spread of all disease around the world. Of the gene editing tools trailblazing in the scientific realm right now, the most popular one is CRISPR-Cas9, or CRISPR for short. CRISPR is faster, cheaper, and more accurate than other techniques of editing DNA and has a wide range of potential possibilities. But what is it and how exactly does it work? CRISPR is actually a natural mechanism found in the immune system of bacteria with two components. The first are short repetitive pieces of DNA called clustered regularly interspace short palindromic repeats which is a mouthful and why we just refer to this as CRISPR. The second part is called Cas9, which is an enzyme protein that cleaves and splices the DNA in these CRISPR sequences. In bacteria, if the repetitive DNA strands are invaded by a virus and its DNA, the Cas9 protein can sense that the viral DNA is foreign. Once it does, it cleaves out this DNA from the bacterial's DNA. In a lab sequence, however, the process is a little bit different. To help understand, imagine that all of your physical characteristics are written out on a long sheet of paper. What scientists do is they design a guide protein that guides the, the CRISPR-Cas9 system to a part of the DNA that they want to edit. Basically, it's like if someone came up to your long sheet of paper of characteristics with safety scissors, cut out the characteristic brown eyes, and replaced it with blue eyes. With the power to change virtually the DNA of any organism, calling CRISPR a powerful tool is an extreme understatement. Scientists have been able to use CRISPR to typically edit the DNA in single-celled organisms, but in the past two years, trials have moved on to more complex organisms like mosquitoes, dogs, and goats. Most recently, however, a Chinese scientist named He Zhuanaki actually used this mechanism on humans. He took the embryos from an HIV-positive father and an HIV-negative mother 
and edited the embryos to remove the HIV strands of DNA. And that sounds amazing, right? Scientists using CRISPR to destroy diseases that have haunted human history for years. But that clearly will not be the limit of its usage. What should stop scientists from editing any part of the genome they choose? For example, changing the height, eye color, physical characteristics of a child based on a, hum on a parent's request, making a designer baby. While CRISPR is a magnificent tool that is capable of destroying these genetic misfortunes and disorders, its usage should be limited and it should not be used on humans. CRISPR gives godlike powers to regular human beings, and that is troublesome because there are certain ethical and negative externalities that are sure to follow. The ethical issues of CRISPR can be broken up into five different categories. Race, unfair advantages, nature, eugenics, and socioeconomic status. Firstly, the gene editing of humans creates a new race of humans, people that are genetically designed. Their genes could be changed so drastically, it may become impossible to even classify them as humans at this point. Scientists could use CRISPR to essentially remove the undesirable traits, thus making a perfect race. This creates an ethical issue because the capabilities of this new race would be something completely unknown to us. Would they be far superior in the areas of physical and mental capabilities? And this brings us into the unfair advantage that CRISPR creates. CRISPR allows scientists to potentially increase the height, physical capabilities, and intelligence of humans. Now that may seem amazing for those genetically modified people, but what about those without this advantage? In any competition of physical capabilities, the designer baby would win simply because his or her talent was created in a lab. The same is true when thinking about someone's intelligence. Regardless of all the studying, tutoring, and preparation that a child may go through, the designer child's intelligence will eclipse those of others because they don't have that advantage. At this point as a parent, you would be doing your child a huge injustice if you didn't modify your child. They wouldn't be able to compete with the other kids around them, and they'd constantly feel like the odd kid out. And no kid wants to feel like that, especially for something they cannot control. The next moral issue of CRISPR's usage on humans is nature. Since Darwin finished analyzing the finches in the Galapagos Islands, Natural selection has been the deciding factor in what traits get passed on to the next generation. But with CRISPR, we seem to assume the role of mother nature and evolution. In the theories of natural selection and evolution, organisms with traits not suited for their environment don't get their traits passed on to the next generation. Using CRISPR takes this away because now the traits that are passed down are decided by scientists instead of Mother Nature herself. The characteristics that make each species special is no longer in the hands of nature. And who are we to decide what traits should and should not be passed on to the next generation? Nature also has its own way of limiting populations through disease. But with CRISPR, would there even be disease? No. It could be completely wiped from our genome, making us resistant to so many ailments around the world by either deleting the DNA for genetic diseases and by possibly adding DNA to prevent from bacterial infections. And I know at face value, it doesn't seem like too bad of a concept. If I could genetically modify myself to never catch a cold again, believe me, I would. I hate buying NyQuil and cough drops just as much, if not more, than the next guy. But this is, in fact, an issue. Making any organism resistant to disease is a dangerous thing to do. In medicine, people are often warned not to take too many antibiotics because the bacteria in their bodies will soon become resistant to these medications, thus making them immortal. 
CRISPR would allow humans to be resistant to so many ailments around the world, there would be nothing to limit our population. People live longer and with less disease, which is actually less sustainable because the Earth can only support so many humans for so long. Another aspect of science that raises enormous scrutiny is the concept of eugenics. Eugenics is a movement that dates back to the 19th century, and it's aimed at trying to purify the human genetic makeup. This movement was born out of the idea that there are several traits that were considered undesirable, and they wanted to stop these traits from being passed on to the next generation. There are several ways that people went about eugenics. In the United States, for example, there were sterilization clinics set in place to stop undesirable people from procreating. The idea was that diseased, undesirable people shouldn't pass down their DNA to the next generation. But this wasn't always what happened at these clinics. People that were diagnosed with alcoholism, blindness, deafness, feeble-mindedness, and promiscuity were often sterilized. Even African-American people were sterilized without their knowing to keep the races in America pure. Another consequence of eugenics is something we now know as the Holocaust. Nazi Germany claimed that this was their way of going about eugenics in a more efficient way. At the time, eugenics lost all of its credibility, but initially, eugenics seemed to be an innovative and efficient way to decrease the spread of disease, much like how CRISPR is now. Much of CRISPR's support comes from the idea that it can stop diseases and undesirable traits from being passed on to the next generation. But there isn't a true limit or definition on what is considered as an undesirable trait. Some may see that as a disease, while others may see dark skin as an undesirable trait and wish to remove it from the human race entirely. Finally, we have the socioeconomic status, which is quite similar to the unfair advantage that CRISPR creates. While CRISPR may be cheaper than most gene editing tools out in the scientific realm, that doesn't necessarily make it cheap for a low to middle class citizen. CRISPR is a luxury that in most cases would only be available to the upper class. As a result, the privilege gap between the lower class and the higher class, upper class, would just get wider and wider because the upper class kids get the advantage of being born with CRISPR and a wealthy family. Over time, they would start to wonder, why do we even keep these poor, inferior people around? And this is what the Nazis referred to as useful, useless mouths. This sort of outlook is an issue that CRISPR would create in today's society. As we have seen through the five categories of moral issues, this technology initially can seem beneficial and efficient in today's world. However, we have seen from science, society, and history that there are grave dangers associated with trying to purify the human race. It may seem that I am discrediting the use of CRISPR entirely, but I assure you that is not the case. This techno technological phenomenon is outstanding, and it deserves to be used, just not on humans. Using CRISPR on plants and bacterium and to prevent animals like mosquitoes from spreading genetic disease are appropriate forms of usage. I hope that conversations will emerge because of this talk and legislations around the world will create concrete limits on how this technology is used to protect the current and future of the human race. It's time to ask yourself and those around you, would you design your baby?